Welcome to the 2022 Black History Month program. My name is Nikia Chambers, and I identify with the pronouns of she, her, and hers. And I serve at Upstate as the Director of Multicultural Disability and Veterans Affairs. Before we begin our program, I would like to recognize, honor, and uplift the indigenous peoples of the Onondaga Nation, the central fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the original inhabitants of the land, as well as the displaced community of the 15th Ward on which our institution sits. We begin our program with an opening prayer delivered by spiritual care chaplain, Reverend Joseph M. Smythe, and the Black National Anthem sung by upstate social worker, Chevelle Jones Moore. Thou who made us to live a life as well as possible, we cry to you today because we need you. As we celebrate Black History Month 2022 and think about mental health, we are conscious that many of us are affected in one way or the other. Many of us are broken, hurt, and uncertain where to find our healing. As we think about mental health, we are aware of our families and members of the community that need to be treated. Help us as a people to trust in those who lead us, those who minister, whether medical or otherwise, and may we find help for the present and the future. As the Creator and All-Knowing One, lead us to the place or places where we will find knowledge, support, and healing. Strengthen our weaknesses and our resolves to be less suspicious and may others treat us justly every day. We look to you and believe you will work with us in making us better. Amen. God of our weary years, God of Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by Thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray oh lest our feet stray from the places our god where we met thee lest our heart drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadow beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. Thank you. At this time, please direct your attention to the opening remarks from President of Upstate Medical University, Dr. Mantash Dewan, University Hospital CEO, Dr. Robert Corona, and our Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Daryl Dykes.
I'm delighted to join the upstate community in celebrating Black History Month. I'm pleased that health and wellness are the themes of this year's Black History Month. The pandemic has been brutal on all of us, but the black community has been disproportionately affected. We need to learn and to proactively respond. I'm happy to celebrate Karen Valerus as the newest recipient of the Sarah Logan Scholarship, given each year to an outstanding medical student. This scholarship honors Dr. Logan, who graduated from Upstate in 1876 as only the fourth black woman to become a physician in the US. We can all look forward to a stimulating talk by Angela Douglas, co-director of Vera House, a partner organization that is crucial to our community. We are grateful for the lives of two people who we honor posthumously, Manny Breland and Jackie Warren Moore, two extraordinary people who changed our community for the better and enriched our lives. Every day, I'm humbled by the magnificence of the people who make Upstate special. And today, I'm inspired by the three amazing Upstate employees we honor today. Chantel Henry, George Baines, and Janelle Gage. Thank you, thank you all for dedicating your careers to Upstate. And a special acknowledgement of, of Chantel, who is a standout employee and alum of our College of Health Professions. Please join me in this thought-provoking program and delicious soul food. Thank you, chefs Lockhart and Williams, as we celebrate Black History Month. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Corona, CEO of University Hospital. I am very proud to be celebrating Black History Month at Upstate, especially proud of the three hospital employees who are receiving Black History Awards. All three work in radiology, George in patient transport, Janelle intraoperative, and Chantel interventional, all have dedicated many years to Upstate's patients. It's a real privilege to work alongside them. And please join me on celebrating them and the celebration of Black History Month. And uh, hopefully you get a chance to reflect on the importance of this wonderful celebration. Thank you. Hi, I too am excited to celebrate this 2022 Black History Month with you all. I'm particularly excited as an individual who was born and raised in Syracuse to talk about our posthumous awards to Manny Breland and Jackie Warren Moore. I have a particular connection with Manny Breland. He was actually my high school teacher and principal at Fowler High School. Over 40 years ago, Manny demonstrated to me true leadership and a true devotion to this community in a way that we now refer to as belonging at Upstate. Everyone mattered, everyone had a voice, everyone counted. They are true uh, leaders in every way and really uh, appreciated here uh, at Upstate and in this community. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Dewan, Dr. Corona, and Dr. Dykes for those wonderful remarks. Next, I would like to introduce this year, Black History Month 2020 keynote speaker, Mrs. Angela Douglas. Angela M. Douglas currently serves as the co-director of Vera House, a Syracuse-based vi victim services agency covering all of Onondaga County within the state of New York. Angela's primary work with Vera House is centered on leading the strategic planning and execution, organizational leadership development, and change management to increase the capacity, deconstruct social norms that maintain sexual assault, domestic violence, and oppression, while advocating 
for systemic change. Angela has a diverse career experience in education, juvenile justice, alternative dispute resolution, nonprofit leadership, and entrepreneurship. She has also been a consultant for over 25 years, providing infrastructure and program design, capacity building, board development, and leadership with grassroots through mature organizations. She has particular talent and a gift for turning around organizations in decline. As of most recent, Angela has had several media interviews and most notably how the adultification of black girls allowed R. Kelly decades of abuse that was published in the Huffington Post. And she is also a contributing writer for the book Stand Up, Resilient Black Women Shaping the World Within Their Faith. Her chapter is Horribly Beautiful, and it is an Amazon bestseller. She is the past recipient of the Michelle Abdur Sabur Exemplary Service Award for the North, North, Northside Learning Center, and also the Community Builder Award for RISE Refugee Immigrant Self-Empowerment Center in spring of 2020. Angela resides here in Syracuse with her husband and adult children, partners, and their grandchildren. She is definitely a catalyst, healer, and organizer. I welcome to you Miss Angela Douglas. Before we get, begin, Mr. Douglas, I would like to present you with the Community Contribution Award on behalf of the Faculty Staff Association for Diversity at Upstate and Upstate Medical University. Thank you. Thank you. It is an honor, a privilege, and a humble opportunity to be with you in thinking about a month that really should be part of history and not just a month, but we get an opportunity as a community to reflect on where we've been, where we are, and where we desire to be. And so I would like to thank Dr. Duan, Dr. Corona, and Dr. Dykes, as well as faculty, staff, honorees, all of Upstate community and our larger community for just the opportunity for us to come together and to think about and reflect on that very thing, where we've been, where we are, and where we desire to be. I would like to open first by saying, let's breathe together. We have been through so much, and it is important for us in the heritage, in the legacy, in our ancestors, my ancestors, who believe in the collective community. We have experienced collectively, we have lived collectively, despite the attack of what individualism has narrated or contributed, we collectively have stood together, and we will continue to do so. I desire to share with you a poem by Sharon D. Brown Rogers because I think it is a wonderful launching place for us today. Black is. Black is as beautiful as a bed of milky white clouds. Black is as beautiful, as soft, as a newborn baby's hair. Black is as beautiful as standing up for what is right. 
black is as beautiful as trying on our grandfather, our grandmother's classy hats. Black is as beautiful as you and I saying hi. Black is as beautiful as two sisters walking hand in hand. Black is as beautiful as you holding your baby for the very first time. Black is as beautiful as saying, I miss you. Black is. Black is as beautiful as going fishing with your dad. Black is as beautiful as two brothers playing basketball. Black is as beautiful as braiding your sister's hair. Black is as beautiful as grandpa taking you to the park. Black is as sweet sound of a saxophone playing. Black is as eating mom's never failed caramel cake. Black is as beautiful as the bright rising sun. Black is as beautiful as a simple kiss placed on the forehead. Black is as beautiful as lilies on Easter morning. Black is as beautiful as saying, I love you. Black is me and I am beautiful. This time together will not be for me a collection of statistics on the plight and pathology of black people related to our health, our mental health, and our well being. Rather, this from me to you, may it be a call to heal. We are living in a revolution. Whether we choose to acknowledge, see, feel, smell, understand the depths of the toil and the despair that we're feeling is actually the opportunity to create, to build, to, to reimagine where we are, who we are as a people. Audre Lorde says, the true focus of every revolutionary change is never re merely the oppressive situations that we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us. Will we recognize that it is that piece of oppression, of trauma, of pain, of grief, of loss that lives in us that, that, that can be changed? No, we don't want to change it. We want to leverage it. We want to exploit it. We want to create a beautiful transformation process, one which I call horribly beautiful. We are amidst a revolution. Might I invite you in to the revolution, to the idea that we really can be, to the idea that who we were created to be is exactly who we are meant to be right now. And that out of that lies the most amazing ideas, solutions, brilliance, wisdom, collectively at this moment than we've ever had before. In the work that I and so many do at Vera House, our team is committed to showing up, to being present, to holding the trauma and the pain. What most do not understand is that black, brown, indigenous, Pacific Islander, historically oppressed and marginalized people oftentimes were not included in the way that the services were built. That our trauma somehow couldn't be contained in a service or in a program. And so we had to spend time collectively healing, individually healing, sometimes being lost in our own healing. And yet, the amount of information related to healing and health and wellness is plentiful. How do we 
not just have plentiful information. How do we turn that from theories and frameworks and concepts and ideas to direct application that shows up in the everyday lives of people? Healing. Will we admit as a people, no matter your size, your frame, your ability, your, your thoughts, your race, who you are, where you are, suburban, urban, rural, tribal, native, wherever you are, can we all collectively understand the grief, the loss, the mourning, and in many ways the delayed mourning as we have watched a pandemic sweep through, and not one pandemic, multiple. I am watching suffering show up and yet oftentimes simple things being overlooked do we know that vitamin d is a is a critical critical mineral that is just so necessary for our body and yet affects our mental health that iron that iron deficiency actually creates depression how do I know these things? Because in, in my family, in my community, I am watching droves of black women, black children, black moms and dads, people coming away saying, I need, uh, they prescribed vitamin D. I am deficient. And yet oftentimes we are looking for these big grandiose solutions and yet sometimes they are so simple and they sit in front of us. I'm asking you today to think about what are the solutions that are sitting right before you? That's the revolution. That's the revolution. You have them sitting in front of you. Can you see them? Will you see them? I'm challenging you. Begin to see. One of the things I will always say, and if you have known me, you, you will hear me say, once you see, you cannot unsee. And once you cannot unsee, then you then are, are required to acknowledge because we know to whom much is given, much is required. What is the requirement? We are asking ourselves. The requirement is to see, but not just to see, but to do. I am watching so many people get lost in the cycle of grief, but understand when we are talking about a historically marginalized and oppressed people, when we're talking about black people, we have compound interest. We are carrying the grief, the loss, the despair, the pain, and the trauma for generations. I think what we're asking is we don't want to carry that. We don't want to we want to be able to lay that down. Why? Because those still resemble the shackles and the pain and the limitations. Because the brilliance that lives inside, we want it to be released. And so how do we get there? How do we get to this place where there is release, where there is liberation, where there is freedom? Tahanisi Coates says, we should not seek a world where the black race and white race live in just harmony, but a world in which the terms black and white have no real political meaning. Let's talk about racial justice. Can I invite you into a thinking about racial justice? We have, we have laid resources and time on diversity, equity, inclusion, but diversity does not get us justice. It gets us a variety. It understands, it contemplates, it recognizes that the difference and that there is greatness in difference, but it does not require action related to the difference. While equality is necessary, it is really just sameness. It is not necessarily requiring justice. Equity and justice are forever connected because that is about fairness. What do we all need? I desire that we all have what we all need. 
Because I know collectively when we all have what we need, then we are also liberated and free to be who we were created to be in ways that blow our minds, in ways that it shows up in music and the tapestries and the fabrics of our community. Social coherence is the ability to see myself belonging in community, in society, in the greater. Health and wellness is related and connected and deeply rooted to our ability to see ourselves in community, to see ourselves as belonging, to see ourselves as a part of something. And so the question is today, how will we do this? There are many among us who count themselves as allies. Michelle Kim is a co-founder and CEO at Awaken, and I love her thought about allyship. Allyship is an active and a consistent practice of using power and privilege to achieve equity and inclusion while holding ourselves accountable to marginalized people's needs. but what does it mean to be an ally? That is, a, that is a very casual word. It is often seen as a badge. It now lives on T-shirts and lives on pins and lives on banners and posters. And, but what does it mean to live to be an ally? And why do we need them? Because if we are going to heal, if black mental health, if physical well-being is to come to pass, we need to recognize the need for justice. We need to recognize that all of these things are interconnected and related. Will we see? Will we see? It's recognizing that as an ally, we don't get to define ourselves as allies. Allyship is not a position. Allyship is not a forever identity. That we come in and out of that. I work to ally in positions that I hold. For what? For justice. To meet people where they are, to provide and engage and bring in, to support, to hold, holding, 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 holding amidst the trauma and the pain. If we are not careful, as Ham uh, Alexander Hamilton has stated, a powerful, victorious ally is yet another name for master, if we are not careful. It comes down to our motive. But what we are really needing are accomplices that recognizing that justice is something that has to be fought for, not just acknowledged, not waited on. Much like delayed grief, there's delayed justice. And when there is delayed justice, there is more pain, there is more suffering, there is more despair. And yet, we don't have to delay. So I'm going to invite the idea of moving into what we call accomplice work. And it was coined by my brothers and sisters and family and amazing indigenous folk. Accomplices don't look for oppressed communities to make them feel better and affirm their work. Accomplices use privilege to address and disrupt others with similar privilege with the intent of moving the system. 
in my work of poverty in our community and across the nation for several years, the thing that I realized is the mousetrap has already been built. The question is, the, the question isn't, can I get people through the mousetrap? We can create financial stability and security. We can move family by family. Did you know the millions of dollars that are returned to a community when everyone is stable? Will we choose community sustainability? But you can't have community sustainability until we are ready to do what Dr. Ibram Kendi says. Will we identify, will we describe, and will we dismantle and then restruct, reconstruct the systems that are keeping that mousetrap moving? That's healing. I can think about my eyes feeling good, my head feeling good, my body feeling good as a two-time breast cancer survivor, I recognize the pain in my sister's eyes, black and brown women who are dying at higher rates of triple negative breast cancer, the one that I do have. But we are survivors. We determine to heal. We determine to open spaces for people to heal. I'm inviting you in. Can I get you to stop to think about healing? We will continue to prescribe, to find, create. Remember, the solutions often are simple. That's the revolution. An accomplice identifies and owns power. I cannot tell you the amount of, of conversations where power is being abdicated from one to the other. Can I get you to own your power? That is healing. I invite you to that. Think about where you have power. That is, our, that is our autonomy. It is where we find who we are. Healing is being fully integrated as a human being and allowing all the things and the experiences and the knowledge, all the things that I have worked so hard for, all the things that have been brought to me, good and bad, that it shapes us all. And we get to bring that to the table of creating this sustainability and this interdependence and recognizing that what I do matters to you and what you do matters to me. That's healing. So I will end with my last quote. Again, if you want statistics, if you are looking for what the data will tell you, you have Google, you have every article, you have TikTok, you have Instagram, you have Facebook, there is data. But is the healing living? Is the data living? What are we choosing to see? Can we move from the data to see healing? If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. That's the request from Lil Watson. That's the request for me. So I am inviting you. I am challenging us as a collective. Will we choose? There is a collective will. It is not merely an individual will. There is a collective will. Will we choose? Will we prioritize? Will we seek? Will we reflect? Will we pursue? Will we rest? Will we liberate? Black health, black mental health, black well being is in our hands, it's ours. Will we collectively choose, prioritize, seek, reflect, pursue, and rest to heal and liberate together? Thank you for the opportunity to be with you, and I look forward to rolling up my sleeves with you and watching all of the solutions and the ideas amongst this revolution come to pass. Be well.
A queen, by my definition, words need no repetition because her actions speak. She wears a crown of many gems, not so the world can see. The things she has to do to feel set free. So every time I see a black woman, I call her queen. Just to remind her that she comes from some form of royalty. She is the wind. And the way the sun kisses her skin, I am enamored by you. Forever will I remain true to you, black woman, queen. Your resilience amazes me. Your ability to turn pain into power. I love you. She is, I am, we are beautiful, and I don't just mean in the physical. There is a rhythm in your step, and quiet as kept, they can't stand your very existence, but all want to shine like your sun. People hate what they can't conquer, and the soul in you is comparable to none, so if I had the time to tell you where I come from, I will tell you my grandmother is magic. I mean, I can go in the kitchen and swear that there was nothing there. And by six o'clock, she'd have a whole spread. I'm talking fried chicken, black eyed peas and cornbread. My belly was full and my soul was fed. Cutting collard greens at the kitchen table is where I learned that she be the root to the tree in which I bear fruit. She be the reason I'm able to pick ripe mangoes from trees and teach you how to peel it. Both in the physical and in the spirit coming from royalty had nothing to do with crowns and jewels. You set my world on fire with your wisdom. Your laughter keeps my heart full. And grandma, tell me your stories. From the cotton you once picked to stumping at the Savoy, she shares with me both recipes for cakes and resilience. And I appreciate those kitchen table talks. I appreciate knowing that one day I'll be 80 something years old and still be able to put on my heels and walk. Been in my life all my life and I ain't never known a love like hers. Never a hug like hers. She squeezed my cares out. And my tears would fade away as if never existing down my cheek. Restoring my strength unknowingly. I grew up rich. I don't remember ever needing a thing. And grandma, I just want to make you proud. Grandma, I just want to make you smile. Because of you, I know love. Because of you, I know joy. Because of you, I am heard. And Grandma, I just want to be your wildest dreams. We are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Thank you, Kari, for honoring us with your words. At this time, the Black History Month Committee and the Faculty and Staff Association for Diversity would like to acknowledge our employee awards this year. I welcome to the podium to present our first awardee, Connie Gregory. Hello, during Black History Month, we take the time to recognize employees at Upstate who are contributing to Upstate's vision and mission and also in contributing to the community. And today we're recognizing Chantel Henry as one of the awardees. Chantel is a manager of interventional radiology where she has developed a recruitment and retention program and foundation for the radiology department. Chantel has been at Upstate for 20 years as an employee. She's a graduate of Upstate College of, of Health Professions with a degree in imaging and she's currently working on a BS degree in business administration through Empire College. In addition, uh, Chantel came to Upstate as a Syracuse City School District graduate from high school. She went to Henniger High School. She also served in the, as a combat medic, excuse me, through the Army Reserve. So she brought all those skills and experiences with her to Upstate. At Upstate, in addition to the radiology department, Chantel works with the quality team, the stroke quality team. She also is a member of the Faculty and Staff Association for Diversity. In the community, Chantel is involved in community walks and runs. She's very involved in the Mary Nelson Back to School event. She has worked with the Duck Race to End Racism, and currently she's a board member of the YWCA. Chantel is dedicated to working hard for Upstate and Upstate's vision and mission and also working in the community. And that is one of the reasons or those are the reasons that we're recognizing her today. Chantel, we invite you to come up.
Chantel, for your passion for your work, your leadership and recruitment and retention, and your dedication to our patients and our community, we present you with this award. Thank you. First, I would like to thank the entire diversity uh, department for acknowledging my work here at Upstate and nominating me for this uh, award today. I've been a part of the Upstate community uh, pretty much my entire life, growing up on the south side of Syracuse uh, as a patient, uh, a student graduating the medical imaging program here in 1999. Uh, coming to work here at Upstate on the uh, staff. I, you know, my entire mission is to provide a respectful, helpful environment um, at work, at home, and I would just like to continue on with that mission working here at Upstate, and I appreciate um, everything the hospital does for our community and uh, for me here as an employee. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Chantel. Thank you, Connie. Next, we would like to honor our Upstate Community Campus recipient. I bring to the podium Reverend Joseph M. Smythe. I am indeed honored to present to you James Bain, an award from the Black History Committee for the work that you have done at the community upstate. I know that over the years you have given all that you have. And so today, I'd like to present to you And so today, I'd like to present to you today this award for dedicating your career to treating every patient with respect and compassion. Thank you, Reverend Smythe. Wow. wow. Um, Thank you, Reverend Smythe. Um, I'd like to thank you for um, presenting me with this awesome award. Um, and I'd like to thank the committee, the Black History Committee at Upstate for nominating me for this award as well. Um, over the years I've, that I've been at Upstate, um, I didn't look at it like I was doing anything special. But they always tell me, they always tell me that you never know who's watching, you know, so do your best at what you do. And that's what I've been trying to do um, every day that I come in and put on my scrubs and go to work for Upstate. Um, over the years, I've met um, many people uh, with my 40 years at Upstate, um, and I met tons of patients. You know, you wouldn't believe um, by transporting a patient from the ED to CT to X-ray um, nuclear med, um, various parts of the hospital, you know, and you have a two minute or three minute conversation with those patients and you learn a little bit about them in that little bit of time. And over the years, I've 
I've learned so much, you know, um, I probably can write a book. <laughs> but once again, I, I, I want to thank the committee for this outstanding award. Again, Reverend Smythe, I want to thank you. And I want to thank the upstate community um, for presenting me with this award. Um, I will be remiss if I didn't mention my wife, whom I've met at Upstate many years ago. Um, and we have a son, James Jr. And um, that is a lot of what keeps me going, you know. So I don't look at it as, as a job. I look at it as doing what I do. <laughs> so, but once again, I'd like to thank Reverend Smythe for nominating me for this outstanding award. I'd like to thank the Black History Committee and my coworkers, and believe it or not, the patients, because without the patients, there would be no me. <laughs> so once again, thank you. I appreciate it. During Black History Month, we recognize employees because of all their contributions to Upstate and Upstate's mission and also to the community. And today we're recognizing Janelle Gage. Janelle is a nurse, nurse manager of radiology and interoperative MRI. When being interviewed, Janelle describes falling in love with Upstate when she was a nursing student at Mohawk Valley Community College. After graduation, she moved to Syracuse, Syracuse to work at Upstate. She has worked at Upstate for 17 years and has as a nurse manager since 2014. She's affectionately known as Boss Lady for her warm, inspiring, respectful relationship with her team. I think that's wonderful, Boss Lady. In addition, uh, Janelle is involved with Upstate's Diversity Task Force, and she has been involved with Upstate's Meds Program. She volunteers at School Careers Day, representing Upstate. And then outside of Upstate, she is a United Way Emerging Leader. She plans to become a mentor with On Point for College, and I'm sure they will appreciate that. We thank Janelle for everything that she's done, and we'd like to present Janelle for this, with this award. So Janelle, come forward. Okay, Janelle, for your compassionate leadership, your talent for nurturing inclusive and collaborative teams, and your ability to inspire the next generation, we salute you with this award. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to um, briefly say thank you to um, my teammates and coworkers who have helped me grow into the nurse that I've become here at Upstate. I'm very proud of the, um, the work that I've done here, and I am looking forward to establishing new relationships both within the upstate community and outside of it as well um, to continue to help our very diverse population that we serve. So thank you. Congratulations to Janelle and James. Next, we will honor the 2022 Black History Month community recipients. Our goal was to drive awareness of Black History Month by lifting black voices and accurately representing the strength, pride, love, joy, and struggle of our black community. Coming to the podium next, is Simone Seward to deliver our first community award.
Good afternoon. My name is Simone Seward and I'm here to present the Community Award. This Community Award is being presented posthumously to the late Emmanuel Eugene Manny Breelin, who passed away on December 4th, 2021, at the age of 87. Manny, as he was known by many, was a pioneer in education and athletics. He was raised in the historic 15th Ward and shared many of his stories and experiences in the documentary, Historic Tour, the 15th Ward and Beyond. Manny was a graduate of Central Tech High School and went on to be many firsts. Manny was the first African American to receive a Syracuse University basketball scholarship. He was a point guard for Syracuse University's men's basketball team from 1952 to 1957, including the first NCAA tournament. He was the first African American high school varsity basketball coach and the first African American principal in Syracuse. Manny was also a Syracuse Sports Hall of Fame inductee in 1992. Here to accept the award on his behalf is his niece, Reverend Kathy Hodge Davis. Reverend Davis, on behalf of the Black History Month Committee at Upstate Medical University, we would like to present this award for the community contribution of Manny Breland, your uncle, for being a strong, visible warrior for social justice, for serving as coach, teacher, and role model to countless young people for strengthening our community. We thank you. Thank you, Simone, and to Upstate, um, and to all who make up this uh, committee. We are so honored and so blessed to receive this award on behalf of my uncle, a man who was a humble individual, a silent warrior um, who fought on many fronts for so many young people. He served as a role model and lived his life as a man of faith and integrity to reach back to his community to make sure that those who were perceived as the least of these had an opportunity to forge ahead to become successful just as he was. He served not only as a coach, but a mentor and a friend, and he was indeed a community advocate. The city of Syracuse knows him as a legend. Some call him um, Boob and later uh, gave him the name of Manny, but we just know him as uncle or um, father. He was a great friend and someone who we knew we could count on regardless of the obstacles. He was a listener um, and a friend. His legacy and his life transcends this city and all of those whose lives he touched um, and he can his name can be heard in cities and states such as washington dc connecticut and even places such as haiti we are honored to say that he was a friend and a relative to many but most importantly a role model and so we thank you for thinking of him posthumously and we know and you know him as the legend, but we say that the legacy will live on through each of us. So on behalf of his sons, Byron Sr., um, Gary, and Daryl, my sister Karen, and I, and all of his brothers and sisters, again, we thank you for honoring the legacy that is Manny Breland. Thank you, Simone and Reverend Hodge Davis, for that wonderful tribute to Manny Breland, a true Syracuse icon. Our next community award recipient is Jackie Warren Moore. Jackie died on August 20th, 2021, at the age of 71 years old. 
but she lived a fruitful life. Born in Elmira, New York, but living most of her life in Syracuse, Jackie received the first Poet Laureate Award in Onondaga County. Her first poetry published in multiple anthologies and two books of her own, Where I Come From and Jackie Warren Moore, Greatest Hits, 1980 to 2003. She served as a columnist for the Syracuse Post Standard and taught writing in prisons and schools. She also worked as a playwright and director for the Paul Robeson Performing Arts Company. She is a survivor of racism, sexism, sexual abuse, and physical abuse. All can be heard and viewed in her poetry as a roadmap of her survival. She spoke up and celebrated what's right in the world and shout out about what was wrong in the world in hopes that people would work together to make the world right for all. I recently had the privilege of visiting the Warren Moore home to present our community award to Jackie Warren Moore. I'm here with you from the home of Jackie Warren Moore. Behind me, you can see her family. Just wanted to share a piece of her story from our own words. I first met Jackie Warren Moore about 40 years ago as a youth in the Paul Robeson Performing Arts Company Youth Ensemble. My favorite memory was performing in the African American Christmas Carol at the Landmark Theater, and I couldn't remember my lines. And it was Jackie who gave me the confidence and worked with me to get my lines straight for my role. It's one of my favorite memories. I also grew very fond of her big warm hugs every time we engaged. She would greatly be missed. I'm gonna pass it along to her family members now to share a piece of their story with Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for allowing us into your home to present you and your family with the Black History Month Community Contribution Award presented by the Faculty Staff Association for Diversity at Upstate Medical University. Jackie Warren Moore, poet, playwright, actor, director, teaching artist, for dedicating her passion, talent, and time to helping others recognize their unique gifts and inspiring everyone to join together to build a better world. My name's Andrew Moore. I was married to Jackie for 41 years, and uh, I can honestly say I, 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 I don't know anyone that had a bigger heart than Jackie. Syracuse is a much better place because of Jackie. Jackie, Jackie, Jackie was a big part of what makes Syracuse special. Hello. My name is Sunsire Warren, and I'm Jackie Warren Moore's very first child. You know, there's young kids that see me now, and, and they're like, hi, Miss Warren Moore. And I, you know, I just say, how you doing, baby? Because that's what she would say. You know, keep it up, keep up writing. Justin Days, and I'm Jackie Warren Moore's grandson. What she's instilled in me you know, what I try to instill into my daughter, just a sense of community, love, and responsibility. I love her, miss her dearly. And they say a relationship is as big as the people you include in it. And Jackie, as a lot of you know, included the whole world. Hello, my name is Cindy. I'm Jackie's sister, baby sister at that. Um, I can remember when we first moved to Syracuse from Alabama. And I used to go over there and she was eating the cookies. We got caught one day and my mother got, got, got in trouble. Jackie, you know better than that. You shouldn't be giving that girl that sweet stuff. She done a lot for the community. She, 
still a lot for the family. Oh, I miss her. I miss all of them, but she, she's here with us. She's here with us. Hello there, my name is Butch, and I'm Jackie's brother. I, I didn't have the fortune of growing up with her. I didn't meet her until I was about eight, nine years old. And when I did meet her, I knew there was something different about her. And as I grow older, the difference was that she was someone special. But the older I got, the more I got where I idolized her and loved that she was my sister. She was someone special that did a lot for the community. Hi, my name is Joy Moore. I'm Jacqueline's daughter. And I miss my mother every day. But I can feel her around me all the time. My mother loved everyone and everything, plants and the community and poetry. And one of her favorite poems um, was a haiku by Langston Hughes. Um, and I'd like to share it. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. And my mom loved this community and everyone in it, and I think that um, she'd be honored to know that um, the community loves her back. Thank you, Moore family, for inviting us into your home and sharing pieces of Jackie in your own words. Next, I would like to introduce Chef Miguel Lockhart. New to Upstate and creator of this month's Soul Food Thursdays. He is originally from Savannah, Georgia, and he serves as an executive chef at Soul Cafe in New York City. He's only been in Syracuse in less than a year, and he just wants to introduce you to a little bit of Soul. Chef Miguel Lockhart. Hi, I'm Chef Miguel from Upstate Community Hospital, where we're celebrating Black History Month with Soul Food Thursdays. All are welcome. What a wonderful and auspicious occasion we've had here today to recognize those who continue to work in this community and those who have gone on before us. So I'd ask now if you would just bow your heads as we leave this wonderful celebration. We're so honored, gracious God, for all that has been said and done for the lives of those who have gone before us, who have given graciously, who have given with poise, grace, and integrity, who have given in excellence. We ask now that you would cover us and that you would bless us, that you would allow us, each of us, to continue to be that light that shines in darkness, that as our paths continue to cross each other, that we will continue to be a help one to another, that we will continue to demonstrate the love that so richly abides in each of us. This is our prayer and we pray it in hopes that you will continue to bless us and encourage us and enlarge our territories as we continue to be about the work of uplifting, encouraging, and building up one another. Amen. That concludes our 2022 Black History Month program. I thank you for joining us and this virtual format. But first, let me acknowledge that no matter how far we have come as a culture, we still have a long road to go. Black history is being made each and every day. And we wanted to inspire people to help bring positive change. And doing so imparts us to 
make sure that we are well and centering on the black experience and black mental health. I wanted to take this time to acknowledge again our wonderful keynote speaker, Mrs. Angela Douglas, our upstate leadership. I also wanted to congratulate our awardees and also our EdCom staff who helped us transition from in-person to a virtual format. And let me not forget our Black History Month committee members and members of the Faculty Staff Association for Diversity for bringing voice to this month's program. As always, everyone, be well and be great. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>